So today I want to talk about leakage. Leakage is that nasty thing that we can either effectively ignore or it makes all carbon credits worthless. So real quick, you know, what is leakage? If I, if I pledge to protect a tree, then that's all really good and that keeps the carbon from that tree out of the atmosphere. But if somebody goes and then cuts down another tree because of that, then that's really bad and what I've done is worth nothing. So that's the fundamental concept of leakage. And there are so many varieties. So let's start with the easiest type of leakage. That is geographic leakage. Geographic leakage just basically means that if I protect a plot of land, will the bad guys just go next door and cut, cut the trees down? It doesn't happen in the United States. You know, nobody is like, you know, some small landowner could protect a plot of land. It doesn't mean that like, t like timber harvesters are going to go to the next door neighbor and knock on their door and ask if they could cut their trees. But it does happen in the developing world where deforestation is a real problem. However, I have often said throughout my career that we should really kind of ignore geographic leakage because I think it's in fundamental conflict with additionality. Uh, and what I mean by this is that oftentimes when I see deforestation rates increasing after a project starts, this doesn't mean that the bad guys went next door. This means that the project was all that much more necessary. So, you know, it, it means that the project is taking place right on the edge of an area that is being deforested more and more every year and it's all that much more required. So I have a real problem with geographic leakage myself. But it's, it's easy to understand and it's easy to measure. So we can just measure it by looking at the satellite imagery from year to year. Um, so that's the easy one. Let's move up a level in terms of complexity now. Market leakage is this idea that if we take trees off the market by protecting them, that's going to drive up timber prices, regionally, even globally, and cause people to cut down some other trees next door or, or some other trees somewhere else. This is almost impossible to measure. You know, maybe you could measure this locally if you actually preserve a, a lot of land within like a state of Brazil uh, and look at timber prices. But, you know, in my experience, timber prices are driven by things like global pandemics or politics or recessions rather than, you know, somebody preserving a single plot of land. So how do, how do carbon projects actually deal with market leakage? Well, they usually just have like a generic discount, like some percentage number. They might not have it at all, but if they do have it, it's just some number that's based on some academic literature that really is very abstract, not, not really grounded in any measurements. So that's market leakage. Now, leakage can be a difficult concept. The next thing that I want to cover is kind of national level leakage. Leakage doesn't necessarily have to refer to a single carbon project. It could refer to an entire country. So the U.S. is a really good example. And you're going to get a little U.S. timber history here. What happened in the U.S. is, you know, post-World War II, we went and cut down a lot of trees. And we were doing that for a couple of decades. 60s, 70s, 80s, we were cutting down massive numbers of trees in the U.S. And nobody really sat down and did the math to see whether or not we had the forest to continue cutting down these trees. In fact, we didn't. We were going to run out of timber supply, at least on the West Coast, by the 2000s. Uh, and so what happened in, you know, the 70s and 80s is that there were these really big climate activist movements. The thing about Americans is that they really like tying themselves to trees that are a two-hour drive away. And they'll find almost any reason to do it. It's really a pastime. And so, you know, Americans started going and tying themselves to tree, big trees that were two hours away, you know, a two-hour drive from where they lived. And that kind of woke up the U.S. government and, and kind of made them realize that a lot of their old forests were being cut down. So in the 90s, legislation was passed to reduce the rate of timber harvesting, uh, at least on the West Coast, and, and make it a lot more prickly for old growth trees to be cut down. And ever since then, U.S. forests have been sequestering more and more carbon. So the U.S. forests are actually taking up a very big chunk of how much carbon you know, the U.S. is putting into the atmosphere. And that's because the forests across the entire country are recovering from this period of very heavy uh, deforestation that took place. So all things are, are great and rosy, right? Well, no. I mean, timber demand did not go down inside the United States. All we did was offset the location that we got that timber from. So now we get timber from places where uh, liberals in California and Oregon can't tie themselves to trees. We get, the, we get timber from Brazil. We get timber from developing nations. 
So effectively, he preserved our forest at the cost of preserving other people's forests. And, and you know, the funny thing is, is that people still want to tie themselves to trees. So even though it's fairly difficult to cut down trees in California, or, or even to, you know, especially to cut down old growth trees, People are still, you know, driving two hours from San Francisco and, and tying themselves around trees that scientists want to cut down for research, you know, to do fire studies. So I just, it's a, it's a, it's a amusing hypocrisy. People will find some way to wrap themselves around trees. But I didn't tell you this story for nothing, because the U.S. forests have been sequestering a lot of carbon for the past three decades. And now we see a bunch of improved forest management projects taking place inside the U.S., and it's left a lot of people to wonder, are they just kind of cashing in on a trend that has already existed? You know, the trees are already growing back. You know, a lot of these areas were devastated in the in the 70s or 80s. They've been just growing back ever since. They're going to continue to grow back. Should they really be issued carbon credits for this societal level decision that the Americans have made to not cut down our forests? So that's one potential problem with American IFM projects in general. There is another leakage problem that I want to talk about, though, because if you are actually successful at protecting your forests worldwide or in another country, and especially if those forests were in some sort of, you know, timber rotation beforehand, then that's going to reduce timber supply on the market. And what that's going to do is drive people to using other materials. And, and that's a really sticky point because every other building material out there is so much worse than timber. Uh, in terms of emissions. So if you actually take trees off the market and drive up the price of timber and convince somebody to then use concrete, that's an enormous amount of CO2 emissions that are being emitted now. Uh, concrete, the process of creating concrete itself, is responsible for 8% of global emissions worldwide. You know, the other alternatives are no better. You know, you've got steel, you've got these plastic alternatives. These are not good. On the other hand, a strong case could be made that if you actually sustainably manage a forest, and take that timber and use it to build a house that's going to be around for 100 or 200 years, uh, then you're actually locking up carbon. This is actually an act of sequestration from the atmosphere. So where all of this is leading me is that there is this real fear among those in the timber industry in the U.S. that these carbon projects are not really doing much, especially the ones in the U.S. Now, now avoided deforestation and reforestation projects, that's all good. But... These, these carbon projects in the U.S. may A, just be taking advantage of a trend that's already been there for a while, kind of already protected trees still being protected, and B, they may be raising the prices of timber uh, and driving people towards unsustainable uh, alternatives towards, towards building projects. And so there is this concern that, you know, really we should be doing the opposite. You know, you know there, there is a feeling in the timber industry, at least, that we should be cutting down more trees. Now, of course, they'd say that. And using that to build, you know, houses and, and preventing people from building houses out of concrete or, or other materials that, that are really bad for the environment. And, and so, you know, I've talked to some old foresters and their feeling is that, you know, a lot of these American projects are not not really doing anything for the environment they may actually have a net negative because it's driving other people driving people towards unsustainable alternatives i don't know how i personally feel about this because you know i don't think it's necessarily right to write off all american conservation efforts certainly the efforts that are conserving land that was already likely to grow back i'm 100 percent on on board I, I think those are nonsense projects <laughs> But, you know, if we are talking about timberland, especially small landowners who were maybe managing their land exploitatively and now can be convinced to manage their land in a more sustainable way, uh, I still think this is a net positive for the environment. But you can see why these are really tricky issues, because now we're talking about, you know, different alternative paths for society at large. How does a scientist even begin to study that? I can study how much CO2 is being saved by a tree. I can't study how much CO2 would have been saved if people used, you know, 13% less, uh, you know, of this instead of this. You know, this is ground for, like, economists and voodoo. So that's why I've been very hesitant to dive into leakage up until now. And that's why I generally don't judge projects too harshly on leakage. Because geographic leakage, I think, just, I mean, is, is just in fundamental conflict with additionality. And market leakage, I think, is kind of impossible to measure.
But these problems are out there, and if we do actually start preserving large chunks of our land, we'll have to come to terms with them. I, I guess, you know, it's, it's one thing that's also worth pointing out is that, you know, concerns of national level e leakage issues go far beyond just the United States. I know I've talked about the United States, but it's a very similar story in the EU. You know, there is this fundamental question, should we be reducing timber demand if, in fact, timber is the best, most sustainable source to build out of? Uh, and if we don't reduce timber demand, then what do all these conservation efforts really mean if we're just going to cut the trees down somewhere anyway? It's, it's a really thorny issue uh, that needs to be addressed at like the national level. And I would like to see more science. So I, I would, I would like to see more science behind, you know, just how much market leakage is a thing at, you know, at the global level and whatnot. Still, it's tough, tough for me to, to go to farmer Joe and say, go ahead and cut down your trees. It's not a big deal for the environment. It, it's just, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> so, so that's that. <laughs> But why stop there? We've talked about leakage for avoided deforestation. It's definitely a thing. We've talked about leakage for IFM. It's definitely potentially a major thing, but difficult to really measure. What about reforestation? Can leakage exist? Well, in the traditional sense, I think no, especially since a lot of these reforestation projects are actually cutting the trees down and taking some of the timber off the land. That's actually putting timber on the market, which is driving timber supply demand down, which is reducing the chance of somebody cutting trees down somewhere else. So this is actually good. So, but one thing that I've actually observed personally with reforestation projects is that sometimes if you're planting trees in areas that are genuinely denuded of trees, the trees that you plant will actually cause other areas in that region to, to reforest a little bit. And this is just due to the natural process of, of seeding. You know, you're providing a source of seeds. And so this is actually reverse leakage. The actions of the project are causing more trees to actually grow elsewhere. So, you know, I think in terms of refore reforestation, most of the time, uh, leakage is not only not a problem, it's actually kind of, uh, you, know, you know, inverted. Um, I'm sure that somebody can point out some scenario in which reforestation has led to trees being cut down, but I can't really think of one off the top of my head. So it's it's mostly an issue of uh, IFM and avoided deforestation. Nor have I been able to think of it in the hours of prep that I do for these videos. Hours. <laughs> I don't just turn the camera on and rant at it. That would be unprofessional.